Welcome to this lecture about the paired t-test. In addition to the paired t-test, we'll also have a look at the corresponding confidence interval, as well as the assumptions for the paired t-test. A paired t-test, also called the dependent sample t-test, is a test that is usually used to determine if the mean difference from pairs of observations is different from zero. To understand the difference between the unpaired t-test and the paired t-test, We'll here look at some simple study designs. The importance is that you here understand the difference between a paired and an unpaired study design. However, keep in mind that to control for external factors, study designs are generally more complicated than the ones shown here. The choice between a paired and an unpaired t-test depends on the study design. Let's say that we have collected eight individuals and would like to test a new drug which is supposed to reduce the systolic blood pressure. To test if the drug has an effect, one could randomly assign the individuals into a treatment group and a control group. Due to chance, person number 1, 3, 7 and 8 were placed in the drug treatment group, whereas person number 2, 4, 5 and 6 were placed in the control group. The individuals in the control group will not receive the drug, Instead, these individuals might receive a placebo treatment. After some time, we measure the blood pressure of the individuals and compare the mean systolic blood pressure between the two groups. Since the individuals in the two groups are independent, an unpaired t-test would be appropriate, which could be used to test if there is a difference in the mean systolic blood pressure between the two groups. Another strategy could be to pair the individuals based on their current systolic blood pressure and gender. These numbers represent systolic blood pressures for the eight individuals before the treatment. We have four men and four women. For example, we could pair person number one and eight who have a similar blood pressure and are both men, and pair person number two and four who are women with about the same stolen blood pressure. And then we pair person number 3 and 6. And finally, we pair the women with the high systolic blood pressures. We could then randomly assign which persons in the pairs who should get the drug treatment. For example, person number 1, 4, 3 and 5 were randomly assigned to get the drug treatment, whereas the other persons in the pairs would serve as controls. After some time, we check the difference in the systolic blood pressure between the pairs. The advantage of this study design is that we will reduce the variability between people since we look at the difference between similar individuals. For this type of study design, a paired t-test would be appropriate because we have observations based on paired individuals. Another common type of a paired study design is the so-called before and after studies. For example, we could measure the systolic blood pressure of all eight individuals before taking the drug, and then measure the systolic blood pressure on the same individuals after a certain time since the start of the drug treatment. Note that all individuals get the drug in this experiment, where their values before the treatment serve as the control. We could then calculate the difference in systolic blood pressure before and after. The data from such before and after design would be appropriate for a paired t-test, since the data comes from paired measurements on the same individuals. Another example of a paired study design is when we analyze the effect of treated and untreated samples extracted from the same individual. For example, let's say that we collect blood samples from three different individuals. We then split the blood into two different wells on the culture plate. Then we add, for example, a drug to only one of the wells so that we use the other well as a control to compare with. After some time, we might analyze, for example, cell survival between the two different wells. Since the cells in the two different wells come from the same person, we could think of this as a pair. Thus, a pair t-test would be appropriate to compare the observed difference in the cell survival between a control and a drug treatment. The advantage of this study design is that we remove the variability between the three individuals. We'll now see how a pair t-test is calculated. As an example, we'll here use some example data on weights in kilos before and after five individuals have tried a new diet 
for three weeks. The differences in weight before and after are shown in the last column. For example, the first person has lost three kilos after the diet, whereas the fourth person has gained one kilo. We then calculate the mean of these differences. We see that, on average, the five individuals have lost 2.2 kilos after the diet. Let's also calculate the standard deviation of the differences, which in this case results in a value of 1.92. We'll now use the pair t-test to determine if we should reject the null hypothesis or not. The null hypothesis states that the population mean difference between the paired values is equal to zero. Whereas the alternative hypothesis for a two-sided test states that the population mean difference between the paired values is not equal to zero. In other words, the null hypothesis states that the diet will not change the weight, whereas the alternative hypothesis states that the diet will change the weight. The mean of the differences in our sample indicates that the diet might result in weight loss. However, we'll now use the pair t-test to see if this absurd difference is enough to reject the null hypothesis. In other words, we'll use a pair t-test to determine if we have enough evidence to say that the absurd weight loss is not just due to chance. In this example, we use a significance level of 0 0.05. The general t-statistic is computed as the mean of the differences minus some hypothesized value, divided by the standard error of the mean of the differences. Since the null hypothesis states that the mean difference before and after the diet is equal to zero, mu d is here set to zero and can therefore be eliminated from the equation. Thus, a t-statistic of a pair t-test is simply the mean of the differences divided by the standard error of that mean. The standard error can be calculated by dividing the standard deviation of the differences by the square root of n, the sample size we see that the standard error is calculated to about 0 0.86. Let's plug in our values for the mean and the standard error in the equation for the t-statistic. We see that the t-statistic is computed to negative 2.56. To compute the p-value, we use the t-distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Since our sample size is 5, the degrees of freedom is 4 in this example. We then use the statistical software to calculate the area to the left hand side of negative 2.56 and to the right hand side of positive 2.56 in the t distribution. The total area in these two tails is about 0 0.063, which would represent our p value. Since the p value 0 0.063 is not less than our significance level of 0 0.05, we do not reject the null hypothesis. Therefore, based on this data, we conclude that the diet has no significant effect on the body weight. One reason why we cannot reject the null hypothesis, although the mean weight loss is 2.2 kilos, could be due to that the sample size is too small. If we had observed the same average weight loss with a larger sample size, the standard error would have been reduced, and the t-statistic would have been bigger. This would lead to a smaller p-value that would allow us to reject the null hypothesis. We can also compute a 95% confidence interval around the mean of the differences. The critical value from a t-distribution with 4 degrees of freedom with an alpha value of 0 0.05 is about 2.78. This value can be obtained from a t-table or by using a statistical software tool. We plug in the values for the mean, the critical value from the t-distribution, and the standard error. The critical value times the standard error is approximately equal to 2.4. We see that our 95% confidence interval goes from negative 4.6 to positive 0.2. Thus, we are 95% sure that the true population mean of the differences in the body weight before and after the diet is between negative 4.6 kilos and 0.2 kilos. Note that this interval includes the value 0, which means that 0 is a possible value. 
Therefore, we do not have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. We therefore come to the same conclusion as for the pair t-test. We now have a look at the assumption of the pair t-test and the corresponding confidence interval. The major assumption is that the values of the differences should be normally distributed when our sample size is small, since we then cannot rely on the central limit theorem. Note that the distribution of the original values are not important because the test statistic involves only the difference between these values. If the differences do not appear to be normally distributed, we could consider using a non-parametric test. If you have seen the video about the one sample t-test, you might wonder what the difference is between one sample t-test and a pair t-test because the equations look very similar. It turns out that the pair t-test is simply just the one sample t-test which is based on the differences within the pairs. Whereas a one sample t-test may also involve the mean of any continuous variable. Therefore, the one sample t-test is not restricted to only differences between pairs. By using a one sample t-test based on the differences, we would have got the same results. This was the end of this video about the pair t-test. Thanks for watching.